Thank you for downloading this episode of a History of Central Florida podcast. This is the podcast where we explore Central Florida's history through the artifacts found in local area museums and historical societies. This series is brought to you by Riches, the regional initiative to collect the histories, experiences, and stories of Central Florida, and the Orange County Regional History Center. I am Kendra Hazen, and I will be your host for today's episode titled, The Spalding Plate. This podcast features a metal plate from the Spalding Upper Indian Trading Store. In 1774, the famous American naturalist William Bartram visited the Spalding Store, which was located in what is now Astor, Florida. Much of what we know about the store is due to his experiences. At the time of his visit, an agreement with the Creeks and Seminoles enabled the British to maintain a store to trade goods with local Indians. Dr. Daniel Murphy from the University of Central Florida tells us about the establishment of these trade stores. The Spalding store was one of these outposts established by uh, European trading companies that had really started emerging in the southern colonies in the late 17th century. And they're very important, not just for the trade goods, but for the interaction they kind of fostered between Europeans and natives. The Spalding store in particular is interesting because it's uh, just off the St. John's River, and it was probably one of the most southern located trading outposts involved in these kind of things. And it evolved over time, not just to be involved in the deerskin trade, but to be kind of a a central supply uh, depot for both Indians and colonists uh, in the region. At the end of the French and Indian War in the 1760s, the British received Florida from the Spanish and divided the region into two separate colonies, East and West Florida. The Spalding store was located in East Florida. When Bartram visited the Spalding store, trading posts like these were part of a complicated exchange of cultures and diplomacy. Dr. Andrew Frank from the Florida State University describes the different types of activities that Bartram might have encountered on his visit. It was an outpost that was part of a really large economic and diplomatic system. Trade and diplomacy went hand in hand. The Indians would come there right as part of both the desire to get better or more desirable material goods and to uh, get rid of surplus deer skins, but they would also go there to trade information, um, to make relationships. And so it was a, a, a meeting ground, right? There wasn't much in terms of cultural production there, right? They weren't engaged in creating some sort of new world there, but rather it was a place where the Europeans who worked at the Spalding store would speak Muskogee Creek. Um, they would engage in kind of the diplomacy of trade. They would have set prices. There would be some haggling and negotiation. There would be gift giving. Um, Often um, the Indians and Europeans would either drink or eat or or, or do some sort of ceremonial functions together. But they would come together largely for the purpose of taking deer skins from the interior of Florida and, and for that matter, Georgia. And so they can get the skins to Savannah and Charleston. And the Indians would go home with the European goods that they're looking for. Everything from needles, thread, beads, buttons, copper pots, bolts of cloth, guns, ammunition, sometimes knives. This would have been one of the plates used to serve meals to visitors. It represents a period when the Europeans and Americans interested in Florida agreed that trade was the key to diplomacy with the Indians. Dr. Murphy tells us how these stores, the native people and Europeans that met there, and the goods they exchanged were part of a larger global Atlantic network. Okay, the, uh, the Spalding store, we, you wouldn't naturally think of it as being part of this Atlantic trading network, but a lot of the, all of the goods that were involved, uh, that were traded at the Spalding store were part of the network in the sense that the deer skins and the other um, uh, skins, pelts, or even um, uh, manufactured goods that the natives created were traded at the store for European goods like tools, occasionally weapons, um, cloth, uh, textile clothing, things like that. And so all of this one way or another influenced economies in the urban centers of colonial America and the emerging port cities of uh, Europe, places, London, Bristol, their ports were um, 
growing in large part due to the commerce that's taking place at these small trading stores. So even though it's a small trading store, kind of the interior of Florida in a lot of ways, all of the goods kind of promoted this Atlantic um, market and both benefited Europeans and natives. You might think that these places would have to be peaceful since they were locations of economic transactions, but Dr. Frank tells us that this was not always the case. There would be conflict, right? They're mutually dependent upon one another, but in all economic relationships where both sides are trying to get the most out of each other, and you go into a trade with a preset understanding of what you should be able to get for your particular deer skin or what a just price would be or how you're supposed to be treated, and those things are always in flux. And so we often have local conflict at stores, and they're the sites of all sorts of localized forms of violence and conflict over the years. But for the most part, they're sustained places of mutual self-interest. So right, when, when, when wars come, sometimes stores become kind of the focus of, of conflict because right, it's, a, it's a pretty well-known entity. Often trade becomes the cause of a war. Right? It, uh, people are frustrated by the bad prices or problems with debt. It can become a place of violence, but for the most part, the Spalding store was a place where Indians and Europeans came together to pursue their own ambitions, but they did so peacefully. Although these stores could experience local turmoil and violence day to day, Dr. Frank tells us that these trading stores actually maintained a great deal of continuity throughout the turnover of colonial administrations. British, the Spanish, the, the United States, well, when it forms, would have their versions and so there was competing stores, right? If you, if you controlled the area, you, you established your store. Um, and some of these stores were able to uh, withstand kind of the turmoil, the European turmoil of the transfer of power from one to the other. So some of these stores would start off as Spanish, then they would become British, and then they would become Spanish again. Uh, eventually, they'd become part of the United States, right? It's, it's the locale, and even some of the people working there would remain exactly the same. They would be... Well, I'm, a, I'm a loyal Englishman one day, and then I'm a loyal Spaniard the next, and then I'll, well, I'll become American, right? So this is, this is my livelihood. And the United States or Spain or, or Great Britain needed these folks because they, they had really good skill sets, right? They, linguistic skill sets, cultural skill sets, and they had clientele. Spain, France, and the United States disagreed over all sorts of things, but the one thing they basically agreed upon is if you control the Indian trade, you can control their diplomacy. While the dinner plate featured in this podcast was witness to these kinds of diplomatic interactions, these stores also served an important function to the settlement and colonization of Florida as a region. Dr. Murphy tells us the impact of these trading posts on Indian resistance to European colonization. Spalding Store and other stores, other trading outposts like that in the Southeast were really pivotal to colonization in the sense that they, um, they allowed the different European colonizers colonizers to get a foothold in the interior, much more so than any mission or a fort would allow them to get, and continually interact with the native peoples. So positive consequences or negative consequences aside, the interaction that was generated between native peoples and colonists through these outposts really kind of conditioned the um, other modes of settlement and other modes of interaction as time went by. So they were kind of the stepping stones for colonization. At the same time, they allowed natives to become more familiar with the colonists. Um, not always, uh, not that they always liked the colonists, but they came to understand them a little bit better and understand their value system, which uh, despite the fact that the colonists were eventually able to push most of the natives uh, west, it probably gave the natives more of a, an ability to resist or at least to accommodate the, the colonists in ways that allowed them to stay in the region longer. After the American Revolution, the British returned the Florida colonies to Spain. During this time, known as the Second Spanish Period, these stores confronted a new nation to the north that was interested in southward expansion, the United States. Dr. Murphy tells us how these stores were caught in a shifting set of circumstances as East Florida changed hands in the early 19th century. The interesting thing about these trading depots like the, the Spalding um, store is that they, you can kind of trace the um, imperial rivalries and boundaries changing during this period. Or during the British period, you saw a lot of these um, trading outposts, especially in kind of the northern tier of Florida. But they began to change in their, their characteristics during the second Spanish period. 
mostly because the the, the Spanish. Um, it's not so much that they discouraged these outposts, but they, they tended to favor some trading groups over others. And there was also a lot more um, hesitation by colonists and what was becoming the United States to trade with these um, outposts over the border. And then by the time the Florida becomes a territory, you essentially see a lot of the, the, the Spalding store type of uh, trading outpost disappear because the U.S. was much less interested in trading with native peoples like the Spanish or the British before them, and this was kind of the dawn of the removal period, too. So they were more interested in actually isolating, um, centralizing, or actually removing the natives. Like the store, this plate was at the nexus of international trade, diplomacy, and the rise and fall of imperial powers who tried to colonize East and West Florida. By the time the United States acquired Florida from Spain in 1822, the Spalding store and its function became obsolete. This plate may be one of the few relics left that speaks to the deterioration of European and Indian relations in the Florida region. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. For more information about the item featured in this episode, visit the Silver River Museum and Environmental Education Center at 1445 Northeast 58th Avenue, Ocala, Florida, 34470. Make sure to join us for our next episode titled Buck and Ball.